What has happened? And what we found out through our observation, I happen to be involved in a management consulting firm, and our specialty is in knowledge services. What is happening as we talk to man our clients and to management, as we, and there's been a, some research in this area, what's happening is that in the organization, in the management of an organization, senior executives, yes, they want those discrete disciplines. They want there to be a specialized library. They want there to be a records unit or an archives unit or a publishing and media department, that sort of thing. But they also want that to be under the arm or under the umbrella of one knowledge strategy organization. They're, they, they are looking for people with, that they can give titles to or he can do the work of something called a director of knowledge strategy or a CKO or a CIO, which we already know about, or how about the CLO, the chief learning officer. So there are roles for people in this area. Uh, to get to those jobs, we'll need people who can work as knowledge specialists, as knowledge strategists, as, this is a new one to me, just in the last couple of years, the KM systems manager. I was just saying to Larry, we were both so surprised recently to find out that in some organizations, the corporate intranet is now being referred to as the corporate KM system. So there are changes, as Linda said, there are massive changes going on in, this, in, in the whole area of management, and we're the people who can come in and, and help work with that. So what are some of the, so what, what are some of the uh, uh, opportunities that we have out there? Well, there, are these, there is this thing that I'm referring to and talking about a lot as the new knowledge services. We're having, the, I just described a little bit of it to you, there are organizations out there that are looking for this kind of leadership, management strength in the people that they hire. And as I say, this is not an iSchool program, it's not a graduate KM program. Now the content of those programs will definitely inform what we're doing, but this is something very, very different. We're actually responding to management needs so that management can connect knowledge strategy with the organizational or the, cor or the or corporate mission or business strategy. So as graduates, if you take this program and you spend 16 months with us and, and you take our core courses and our, our uh, other courses, our electives, what, is, what are you going to be doing? Who are you going to be? Well, you're going to end up working in what I like to think of as the strategic knowledge field. This, that's our profession. It's strategic knowledge. Strategic knowledge management, if you want to call it that. Strategic knowledge services, if you want to call it that. The key thing is it's strategic to the organization. I like to think of your role as not so much as a strategic knowledge professional, but as the knowledge thought leader for the entire organization. You're the person who is going to be responsible or at least leading the effort to facilitate new ways of thinking to ensure that information and knowledge flow throughout, throughout the organization and is built into the work processes. You'll be capturing and connecting content and, and putting ideas and translating <coughs> ideas into practice. Uh, you'll work with ROI, you'll work with performance measures, uh, you'll work with IT and ICT specialists all the time. I mean, after all, the whole knowledge domain is run by or fits into what happens with uh, information technology. These people, you're going to be referred to as a systems thinker, you're going to be a content provider, and you're going to be what I like to think of as your best role, you're going to be a change agent and knowledge gatherer. If you take this course, <clears throat> this program, and you earn this degree, I think you'll be in the upper echelon of the people in this country who are leading knowledge strategy. I want to talk specifically about a course in business analytics and competitive intelligence. Now, the first part of that might sound a little dry. It might sound like something an accountant does, business analytics. The second part might sound a little oversexed. It's uh, kind of got a James Bond ring to it with the competitive intelligence piece. Cloak and dagger operations, black bags, and surveillance. Neither are true. Business analytics actually right now is a very important and emerging field. The key parts about it are being able to track what most people are calling key performance indicators. Watching those things that mean a lot to your company. Now, if you're working for Victoria's Secret, it's going to be very different. Those key performance indicators are going to be very different than if you're working for Nestle's or Nike or General Motors. But everyone has their own set of key performance indicators. Knowledge professionals are the ones 
that actually help determine what things count most. The CEO certainly may want to see how much silk is going across the marketplace or the cost of, a, of, a, of elastic if he's working for Victoria's Secret. But as a knowledge professional, you might be the one to tell him that doesn't really count to you, boss. What really counts to you are these three things. Those performance indicators are based on what you know means something in the marketplace, what things are actionable, what things are going to be applicable to their daily business. Now, the information professional who has an idea of what strategy is, is plays a key role here. Sometimes we're brokers of information. We know where information can be had and obtained and fed into our system. Sometimes we're the people that can talk to IT where other people can't, where marketers and other strategists can't. We understand their language, we, we speak in terms of projects, and we know how to bring information out of our own data sets. And the key other thing was we know where external data can be had. And we know what information can be brought together in real time or what information can be brought in quarterly, monthly, annually. Now, on the competitive intelligence side, I, I actually have to say I, I have enjoyed saying that I work in competitive intelligence when I'm at cocktail parties. It sounds very intriguing. It's, uh, uh, I am nothing like a spy, and I would not, never make a good one. And in fact, competitive intelligence is really about above the board and legal activities and the right things to do to find out information about what's happening external to your organization. Not every organization has a competitive intelligence function. You'll find it kind of integrated in with strategic planning, general business planning, new product development, and a couple other categories. <clears throat> to me, competitive intelligence is really about knowing what external information exists and how to get it. You've all heard of the term SWOT analysis, I'm sure, right? It's kind of a fun term. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Competitive intelligence is mostly about the opportunities that your company might have and the threats that it faces from its competitors. You're identifying how those inf that information can be analyzed and distilled to make something actionable will be, is the key to your effectiveness in competitive intelligence. It's an outward-focused discipline. And I think that if... Um, here in the course that we will teach, it will be about where those sources are and how those sources can be brought to bear to make an impact on your business. What percentage in your organization do you spend on knowledge, do you think? Money, non-capital goods, so not stuff, everything else. What percentage do you spend on knowledge? What do you think? Take a guess, try, try it. It turns out it is about 60 to 70% in almost any organization in the United States with over 100 people is spent on knowledge. Knowledge gives meaning to information. It what, it's what makes information valuable. Without it, it's just stuff. Knowledge, it's what people know and groups of people know. And we're in a dilemma. That's why it's great to take these classes and to take this degree. Because our organizations in the US, in Japan, in Western Europe, and somewhat Latin America, are not built to work for knowledge. They're built to work for the traditional sources of wealth, land, labor, and capital. They weren't structured originally for knowledge. And we still live with 19th century models in a 21st century knowledge economy. Henry Ford, who probably epitomizes the industrial type of model, said, why do I want to pay for a worker's head? I only want his arm. People still believe that. They may not use such language, but they still believe that. Our organizations are based on command, control, and hierarchy, and fear. When organizations first came about in the 19th century, the model they used was the military. Command, control, hierarchies, and fear. This does not work for knowledge. It worked fine for land, labor, and capital. The wealth of the world has increased 17 times from 1880 to 2010. We are infinitely wealthier than our great-great-grandparents in things we own, in technology, any way you want to count wealth. We live longer, but we run our organizations as if they were all like Ford. Not all over the world, it's changing. It's certainly changing in countries, it's changing somewhat in Brazil, in Africa, some Asian countries, but we still do it in the United States. So we have to find new ways of organizing ourselves to better exploit and explore how knowledge works. We have to find new ways of working, organizing work, organizing the organization. So it finds new knowledge, it brings knowledge in, it encourages development of knowledge. Look at how Google works, if you want an example of how this works. Compare Google to Microsoft. 
and you'd see very clearly two different models. And who's more successful? I'm going to talk a little bit just quickly about the program format. Uh, this is a 16-month program that starts in September and then finishes up in the following December. The reason we chose 16 months, it's not a magic number. This is based on a lot of research out there on the design of effective master's programs and is really by design meant to encourage your success in the program and your completion of the program. 16 months in terms of the research is kind of magic in the sense that if we can move students through programs to the targeted outcomes of the programs in that time, students stay engaged and they generally graduate and do very well. So that's why we chose 16 months and that's what the design of this program is all about. There are three residencies in the program, one at the very beginning of the program, one at the end of the spring in the second term, and one at the beginning of the final term. During those residencies, we have five days of face-to-face -face intense interaction here on the campus uh, where we will do face-to-face -face components of coursework, where there will be networking events uh, with faculty, with other students, and with invited industry experts who will also be talking um, and providing workshops during that time. Um, there may be site visits during that time to interesting uh, companies related to the the, uh, the different courses that you'll be working in. So that's the residency component. And then in between the residencies, we have courses online um, that will fill in the gaps between our face-to-face -face moments. We are offering our online courses that are part of this program on a cutting-edge platform that we have developed um, that's really meant to uh, encourage easy access to content um, and the best content possible in terms of assisting your learning. Um, it is framed by live sessions that will happen every week through Adobe Connect Professional. I'm sure some of you have done web conferencing before. Anybody? So it's a very nice web conferencing platform that's highly interactive and that allows you to listen to lectures as well as to um, um, break out into groups, talk in those groups, and come back into the larger lecture, similar, uh, just in the same ways that you would in a face-to-face -face classroom. It's just through, through online. So there's a live component of our online experience, and there's a very social component of our online experience. If you were Mary Anderson, this is showing you all of the stuff, that's the, the latest stuff that's going on in your classes. So if there are discussions going on in your classes, or if your faculty members have posted announcements, or if um, folks in your class are tweeting about something in the class, it will show up here and you can go directly to those posts. So basically, uh, you, you'll move through courses unit by unit. In the central part here, whatever you're um, looking at in unit one, there might be lect video lectures here. There might be access to software that you're using in the course. Um, there may be readings, et cetera. Um, all of the readings will be accessible. Either you can buy the books or you can download them into the system. There's a very nice reader um, that can be read on almost anything, a Nook, an iPad, et cetera. So it's, it's pretty cutting edge in terms of the delivery of content. Also on the side where you see, again, there's a news feed of student interactions going on in the course discussion forums, et cetera. Those news, news feeds hook out into the profiles of your fellow students, so you can click on those profiles and learn about where your fellow students are coming from. They also click out to immediate access to live chat and to Skype. So it's kind of a communication portal through which you can contact your fellow students, which is really nice, um, especially in courses where there are team projects, et cetera, that you'll be working on. Questions? Yes. I have a question with regard to the interface um, and the actual um, digital experience um, for classrooms. Um, humans <coughs> communicate visually, and I was interested to, to know whether we as students can communicate through visual or video conferencing with the actual professor in addition to conversing with students outside of class. Yes, so uh, the way that the, the online courses work is they will have X number of large group live sessions with the faculty and the TA. Um, and those sessions will remind you of face-to-face -face classroom sessions in the sense that there will be lecture 
Um, it may be that we pre-produce some of those lectures. You watch them for homework, and then it's more of a Q&A session. Um, the, the faculty can put you in breakout groups, bring you back. You can present to the rest of the students in the class whatever ever you've done, if you've been working on an Excel sheet or if you've been writing something together, et cetera. So that's what those live sessions look like. And in this program, do you have any kind of uh, mentoring or career counseling? Well, we have, we have um, the School of Continuing Education. First of all, you have access to the, um, the University Career Services Office, but we also have in our school a, an in-house Career Services Office that is um, designed specifically to deal with uh, the special needs of the students in our programs, because our programs are, are diff quite different from some of the other programs in the university in that they're professional applied programs for the most part. So um, you will have access to those services. Um, certainly when you're on campus, um, they'll be here for you. And we will be working on, on ways to uh, make those available to you across distances also. I'm really interested in two things, the capstone project. Can you tell me some of your more sort of um, favorite projects and then also some success stories from graduates and alumni? Um, the, capstone, the capstone project uh, focuses um, in two particular areas. One in using um, one aspect of your current work um, to develop an idea, to explore an idea that you might not be able to at, at the workplace. So using the workplace as, as the foundation for your capstone project. Or to look at something that you want to get into. So a whole new area that you want to, want to explore. Um, I mean, we, we have had people who've done that and actually did land jobs in, in, in um, these areas, in the digital asset management area, for example. So it was something they wanted to explore, and they were able to actually use that, um, that experience to um, explore um, new, near, new career options and develop an expertise that they didn't have before. Is there any, the question is, is there any difference between C, CIO, CKO, uh, uh, CTO, and I also mentioned CLO, Chief Learning Officer. Uh, there has been, there has been, but one of the things that we're noticing, and very much in the last couple of years, uh, I'd say last three or four years, uh, is that there is a great melding of this. And as I mentioned earlier, in our in a lot of the work that I, I'm involved in, with is this area called knowledge services which converges information management, knowledge management, and strategic learning, the learning you need for the knowledge sharing in the organization. And what we're finding in companies and organizations is that this is merging together. And that's why I gave that example about uh, the, the corporate intranets now in some places being referred to as the corporate KM system. Knowledge seems to be the, um, maybe it's temporary, we don't know, but it sort of seems to be the, the, the word that all of these different disciplines, these, the, these discrete disciplines I've been referring to, they seem to like to be merging toward the knowledge construct. Uh, why that is, we get into a whole semantic discussion about what goes on in the language and that sort of thing, but we're seeing a lot of direction in that area. So my answer to you, my response to your question would have to be, uh, there has been in the past differences between a CTO, a CIO, a CKO, <coughs> CLO, but we are now seeing those merge closer together. And then as we get into an, or, uh, an organizational position like a director of knowledge strategy, that's going to be in charge of all of those discrete disciplines. If you look at LinkedIn and look at the kind of titles that are built around terms like uh, business analysis, look at knowledge management or knowledge officers, um, and look for intelligence, either business analytics or business intelligence experts, and you'll see the kinds of jobs that are out there today. Now, they're going to fall in a couple different continuum groups. Among the consultancies, for example, uh, there are knowledge experts, and they tend to be industry-focused knowledge experts within industry verticals. Their job is not really just to be the smartest person in the room about cars or about apparel. Their job is really to hold the information, the, the knowledge that's already known, things that have already been written by the organization so that they won't reinvent the wheel every time a consultancy operation comes in. It's also to capture the knowledge of the individuals, much along the ways of what Larry was talking about, to know who in the organization knows what, what, and what they know. 
And there's become new ways within intranets where people are capturing knowledge and expertise from um, the people that are in their staff. So that there's something institutionalized about that, especially, which is very important. So how many courses are you doing? So, okay, so the, the program design is that you take uh, in the beginning of the fall session, you have this four-week intensive course that has 12 instructional hours in, during the residency. Then there's a short break. Then you have a 10-week session during which you have two courses. And then there is a longer winter break. Then there's another 10-week session during which you have two courses. And then there's a fairly long spring break. And then there's a four-week session where you have one course that also has 12 hours of face-to-face -face instruction in the residency. When you move into the summer, that's when you're in the elective zone. You choose two electives during the summer. We'll have a list of electives that are associated with the program, but of course, in the school we offer many electives. Um, we are also putting lots of other courses in other programs online. So I mentioned our business courses. So depending on your purposes, the topic of your capstone project, the outcomes you're targeting as a student post-program, there are elective options in the summer.